British Columbia is a vast province. With over 944,000 square kilometers of land, British Columbia is Canada's third largest province. And this very large province hosts some of the world's greatest ski resorts. Resorts like Whistler, Sun Peaks, Revelstoke, and Fernie are all international destination resorts and are all widely acclaimed. But there are also smaller community hills, like Shames Mountain, Harper Mountain, and Manning Park. However, unknown to many skiers, British Columbia is home to a host of abandoned ski hills completely forgotten in time. Some of these places have been closed for decades, virtually nothing remaining of the original skiing operations. Other hills have left behind traces, rusting T-bar lifts, old ski lodges, and ski runs barely visible on the mountain. These places, though now quiet, were once bustling enterprises, many being the heart of the communities they served. One by one, they all closed for various reasons, their memory slowly fading away. In this video, I will take you through most of British Columbia's lost ski areas. Please note that there are many more forgotten ski areas in British Columbia, but including all of them would have been incredibly challenging, so what I have here will have to do. With that said, let's jump into this video. Number 1. Morning Mountain Morning Mountain, also known as Blewett Ski Hill, was located a short drive away from the town of Nelson. The ski hill opened in 1974 when the community came together and purchased a Doppelmayr T-bar lift. The hill was fairly small, up a north-facing mountain, yet had around six marked ski runs. In the late 70s, the club even installed nightlights in almost all the runs, making it easier for residents to get a few laps in. The club operated with this business model for many years, until 1999 when the ski lodge burnt to the ground. Faced with either the choice to collect the insurance money or rebuild the lodge, the club chose the former, choosing to close ski operations. The ski hill had been on the decline for many years. Poor snowmaking, combined with aging infrastructure and declining skier memberships, all had spelled the end of the club for many years. The lodge fire was simply the straw that broke the camel's back. Morning Mountain is now a provincial park. Even though all ski infrastructure has been removed, the area is now a popular hiking spot, and you can easily spot the old ski runs on the mountain. Number 2. Crystal Mountain Last Mountain Ski Resort opened in 1967. It's functioned as a small, day-use ski area near the city of West Kelowna. It originally opened with a Mueller double chairlift, a Harouche T-Bar, and a Doppelmayr T-Bar. While Lost Mountain's competitors, such as Big White and Apex, kept expanding their terrain into destination resort status, Last Mountain remained a small, family ski area. In 1992, the resort rebranded as Crystal Mountain. The early 2000s saw Crystal keep expanding when they replaced their aging Harouche T-Bar with a used Poma Triple from Europe. Apart from this investment, the ski resort continued to operate in its current condition with little reinvestment into the hill. In March of 2014, a serious deroping of the Mueller Double resulted in the hospitalization of four people, two of them ending up in critical condition. This spurred on many lawsuits against Crystal, resulting in the closure and abandonment of the ski hill. However, all hope isn't lost for Crystal, as a new owner is working very hard to reopen the mountain under a new name, Bull Mountain Adventure Park. He appears to be getting very close to reopening at least the beginner T-bar at Crystal. While the time frame is somewhat unknown, Many improvements to the ski resort have already been made, and a reopening in the next couple of years looks very likely. Number 3. Forbidden Plateau Vancouver Island used to have five downhill ski areas, Mount Aerosmith, Green Mountain, Forbidden Plateau, Mount Kane, and Mount Washington. Only the last two on those lists remain as active ski resorts. Wood Mountain Ski Park opened in 1966, when the provincial government completed a land swap with a logging company in order to establish a park on Forbidden Plateau. As part of the park, 240 acres would be devoted to the Wood Mountain Ski Park, with the province retaining the title. By 1972, a chairlift and a few T-bar lifts were constructed by GMD Mueller, and the ski hill was ready for operation. The provincial government handed over operations to a non-profit organization titled the Mount Becker Ski Development Society. The Mount Becker Ski Development also changed the name of the resort from Wood Mountain to Forbidden Plateau. In 1984, the Mount Becker Ski Development declared bankruptcy. The mountain narrowly avoided being stripped as around 50 Camo Valley residents created a new company and put up the cash to save the ski hill. 
Forbidden Plateau continued to operate through the 80s, although several poor snow years forced early season closures. Some seasons, the hill was only open on select few days. The addition of the Mount Washington Alpine Resort, which had a significantly larger vertical drop, led to Forbidden Plateau struggling through the 90s. On February 27, 1999, the Ski Hill Lodge roof collapsed under a heavy snow load. Thankfully, everyone was able to escape, but the lodge was heavily damaged. Even though the roof was rebuilt a few months later, the Ski Hill never opened for the 1999-2000 to 2000 ski season, citing a disastrous few months. According to the then president of the Forbidden Plateau Ski Recreation, the Ski Hill needed around $1.5 million to help modernize the hill. But the nail in the coffin for Forbidden Plateau was when the lodge was destroyed by arson in 2002. Since then, the former ski hill has deteriorated further and further. The chairlift was removed as recently as 2019, after sitting idle for many seasons. Nowadays, all that remains of the once popular Forbidden Plateau are the grown-in ski runs. Number 4. Green Mountain The Snowbird Ski Club started in 1954 on Vancouver Island with a 300-foot-long rope tow on the slopes of Mount Branton. The tow serviced mostly beginner to intermediate ski trails. Unfortunately for the Snowbird Ski Club, poor snowfall, paired with a lack of expert terrain, spelled the end for Mount Branton. The club evaluated several sites for a potential new ski area, and Green Mountain was the one chosen. By 1959, the club had secured a 600-acre lease to Green Mountain with the logging company. By 1961, the club had built a rope tow and an A-frame chalet. The Snowbirds had big plans for Green Mountain, which included a chairlift up the snowy slopes. Ultimately, the club was not able to finance and build a chairlift, and instead built a Doppelmayr T-Bar in 1967. The 1969 ski season saw record snowfall, and the T-Bar had to regularly be dug out of the fresh snow to operate. This meant that few skiers could get up the access road to enjoy the snow. Few skiers meant low revenue. However, the club survived this disastrous season and in 1973 installed a second Harush T-Bar that reached the summit of Green Mountain. Green Mountain had a poor relationship with the provincial government as the club said the government should maintain the access road while the government said the ski area should maintain it. In 1975, the provincial government proposed to spend taxpayer dollars to build a new ski resort near Ladysmith. While this plan never came to fruition, it angered Green Mountain skiers who felt that the government was recklessly spending taxpayer dollars on a low elevation beginner mountain while ignoring the functioning ski resort on the island. Green Mountain operated through the 70s and early 80s. In the fall of 1983, an act of arson burnt down the Doppelmayr T-Bar lift shack. The ski area, which was struggling for money, was forced to fix the T-Bar lift, which included replacing the haul rope and fixing the hydrostatic drive. The hill barely managed to scrape by that year, using a backhoe as the generator to power the T-Bar, as the original one had been destroyed. Green Mountain asked the North Cowichan Town Council for aid, which the council refused. This led to the mountain being abandoned by the latter half of 1984. Both lifts were removed, and the chalet was raised. There were several attempts at bringing back Green Mountain in the mid-80s, however, none of those attempts gained any traction. Today, there isn't much remaining of Green Mountain, apart from a few rope tow towers that never got removed. Number 5. Kelowna Mountain Kelowna Mountain has a very messy history behind it. The land was bought by an investor named Mark Constantino for $7 million in 2005. Constantino had grand plans for the land, including a vineyard, wine caves, a welcome center, several suspension bridges, a massive sundial, and a ski resort. Apparently, he didn't bother to rezone any of the land and went ahead with building his vision. Much of the money Mark Constantino used was funded by investors who had purchased $40,000 or $150,000 shares. In 2012, the BC Securities Commission halted further investments on Kelowna Mountain for 15 months. However, during this time, Constantino was also sued by the city of Kelowna for ignoring all zoning laws. This left the investors, many of whom were retirees, in bad financial situations as their investment disappeared into thin air. Eventually, the BC Securities Commission lifted the ban and Constantino reopened much of the mountain and was allowed to pay back some debt. On November 29th today, 2013, the British Columbia Securities Commission, BCSE, granted approval to Kelowna Mountain Limited Partnership 
to continue trading its limited partnership units in Kelowna Mountain. Then, in 2018, a court ordered that part of the property be sold to pay back unpaid loans. Somehow, though, Constellagneo found a way to find a new lender who agreed to pay back the loans, and the mountain has remained under his control. Since then, Constellagneo repaired the abandoned Welcome Center and opened his suspension bridges to the public, but has left the ski resort and vineyards abandoned. As to the rest of the property, it remains to be seen if Constellagneo's plan will ever come to fruition, or if it will remain abandoned as an eyesore to the community. Number 6. Kitsum Callum Kitsum Callum is a case of a resort being hurriedly built using taxpayer funds without doing proper market research. The ski resort opened sometime in 1973, which was a good snow year. Several government dignitaries were transported up the future ski hill in a tile called grooming machine. They liked what they saw, and a few years later, Kitsum Callum opened to the public, built on taxpayer funds. Kitsum Callum boasted a Mueller double chairlift and a Doppelmayr T-bar lift. Several runs featured night skiing on the lower mountain. Unfortunately, by 1984, the operation imploded on itself. According to a columnist from the Terrace Standard, the ski hill had multiple issues from the start of its short lifespan. The chairlift started on a level below the normal snow line, which made operating it a challenge for the hill. The chair ended at the top of the mountain, with only advanced terrain appropriate for expert skiers. Most of the clientele of Kitsum Callum were beginner to intermediate skiers, who were stuck on the T-bar lift on the lower mountain. Thankfully, a new society formed, with the goal of building a new ski area higher up in the mountains with better terrain. They purchased all of Kitsum Callum's equipment, including the lodge and chairlift, and after many hard years of work, opened what is now Shames Mountain, still in operation today. At the same time, work on the lifts was being completed. The Shames Mountain Corporation bought the old lifts from the Kitsum Kalem Ski Hill and is using part of that equipment on Shames. As far as the chair goes, the only thing we use from Kitsum Kalem are the towers and the shiv assemblies along with the return station. The whole drive assembly um, is new, new haul rope, all new chairs, all new controls, and we did manage to salvage the lift huts off there. The T-bar is basically the same as it was on Kitsum Kalem. We've added a couple towers to that and lengthened it, a couple more hangers, um, but basically it's the same equipment. The lifts have cost about $1.2 million in total, and Grabowski says buying the Kitsum Kalem equipment was a good move. These lifts now will run as new, and the value on these lifts now, if you replace them with new material, would probably be up around two, two and a half million dollars. So it was a, a good investment to rebuild the old stuff and marriage it with the new. To this day, you can still make out the runs of the former Kitsum Callum Mountain, a reminder to the town of this failed ski hill. Number 7. Lac Lejeune Lac Lejeune opened in 1947. It offered downhill, as well as cross-country skiing, serviced by a rope tow and a small chalet. It kept expanding and eventually boasted seven trails, ranging from beginner to advanced. Lac Lejeune even purchased a Mueller T-Bar, servicing all of their terrain. While Lac Lejeune's competitors kept modernizing their equipment, Lac Lejeune stayed as a throwback hill, operating as the small, family-friendly ski hill. In 1992, it was deemed too unprofitable to operate. People were going to the bigger hills, not Lac Lejeune. Thus, the ski hill closed and has been frozen in time. All the infrastructure is still there, though it is showing extreme signs of deterioration. Number 8. Mount Aerosmith Today, Mount Aerosmith is frequented by hikers who come to admire the stunning mountain peaks and natural beauty. But back a few decades ago, this mountain was the site of a popular ski resort. The Mount Aerosmith Ski Resort was formally initiated in the 1970s when logging company Macmillan Bloedel donated 1,400 acres to the provincial government for a park. The company had previously installed two rope toes on Mount Aerosmith so skiing here wasn't a foreign idea. The one main concern with the proposed ski area was the fact that there was no road and the provincial government was unwilling to spend the money to put a road in. Nonetheless, the residents of Port Alberni pulled together and raised enough money to put in an access road, and by 1974 had a ski facility. Mount Aerosmith consisted of a Doppelmayr center pole chairlift and around 12 runs. Interestingly, 
The chairlift was originally purchased by the owners of Mount Norquay in Alberta as part of a ski area expansion before Parks Canada killed that expansion. So Mount Aerosmith was able to get a 25% discount on the basically new chairlift, only paying $85,000 for the entire machine. The ski club built the lodge that same year and everything was good to go. The ski club operated the double chairlift and in 1978 expanded the ski area with the Harush T-Bar on a completely different mountain face. The ski area began branding itself as the only one ski area with two on Vancouver Island. In 1980, the lodge burnt down, closing the ski area temporarily until a new lodge could be constructed. In the mid-1990s, the lower half of Mount Aerosmith with the chairlift was abandoned due to low elevation and low snowfall levels. In 1999, a new alpine village was proposed in Mount Aerosmith by two Port Alberni farmers, featuring a 9-minute gondola ride from Highway 4 to the Mount Aerosmith ski area. This plan never went anywhere. By January of 2000, the ski area had opened for one weekend before closing temporarily. The company that operated the ski hill blamed too much snow. The ski hill remained closed for the rest of that year, though there was much interest in reopening the hill. But in October of 2002, the ski lodge was destroyed by an act of arson. This nail in the coffin came after months of the lodge being trashed by vandals. Thus, the Mount Aerosmith Ski Park came to an end after three decades of serving the residents of Port Alberni. Today, there are still many remains of the ski hill on the mountain, including most of the two T-bar lifts, but this one has completely faded into the past. Number 9. Mount Hayes Mount Hayes, probably the most unique lost ski area in Western Canada. Although you wouldn't know it now, Mount Hayes was once the site of a busy winter ski hill featuring a four-passenger detachable gondola and a T-bar servicing a handful of ski runs. The resort originally opened in 1975 when GMD Mueller constructed the gondola and T-bar up Mount Hayes. While the hill was originally developed privately, by the early 1980s it ended up in the possession of the city of Prince Rupert who ran it as a public recreation area. While the runs in Mount Hayes weren't the longest or the steepest, they did provide the town with an affordable ski hill close to home. Unfortunately, due to poor snow conditions, many of the winter openings had to be delayed until January or February. As time went on, more and more city councillors started questioning if financing Mount Hayes was actually a good idea. Even after several investigations, Mount Hayes remained. But with the addition of Shames Mountain in 1990, which had superior snowfall and better runs, Mount Hayes started to struggle. Paired with a few poor snow years, Mayor Peter Lester made the decision to pull the plug on the struggling ski hill in 1996. Ironically, this came after an extensive renovation of the mountain chalet and after many upgrades to the gondola. The T-bar was removed and much of the gondola sold to Purden Ski Village, though it has not been put up. The mountain chalet burnt down shortly after the ski area closed. All that's left of the Mount Hayes Ski Resort are around 12 gondola towers in the mountain, relics of a rich but forgotten past. Number 10. Silver Tip A relatively unknown lost ski area in British Columbia, Silver Tip played an important part in teaching many generations of people to ski. Silver Tip opened in 1963 with two rope toes. The hill was started by a group of local skiers who sought to provide the Sunshine Valley area with their own ski hill. 1965 saw the small ski operation move to a higher elevation spot on the base of Silvertip Mountain. In 1969, Silvertip expanded with a Dalpemeyer T-bar lift traveling up the slope, servicing three beginner trails. While the ski area itself was quite small, investors had big plans, including a $300,000 double chairlift rising 2,200 vertical feet. The chairlifts would be over 6,000 feet long. These plans never came to fruition, but were quite commonly discussed by the ski area, though it struggled through the 1970s due to cost of maintaining the access road. Silvertip never materialized any of the grand expansion plans it once boasted. In the late 1970s, the ski area was purchased by two brothers, Don and Ray Lowe, who planned to incorporate the ski area into a much larger Four Seasons resort. While the resort was fairly successful, the ski area was not, and after several poor snow years in the late 90s, finally shuttered. There has been some interest in recent years of a potential reopening of Silvertip with a larger footprint, but nothing has ever come to fruition with that plan. Number 11. Snowpatch 
Snowpatch was the dream of local resident of Princeton, Jim Jackson. Jackson had been involved in the community of Princeton for many years prior, and was an avid lover of skiing. He supported new ski resort developments, such as Apex and Manning Park. In the 80s, Jackson enlisted friends and members of the community to help build a new community ski hill. Snowpatch featured a Harush T-Bar and around three to four ski runs. It isn't known when or why the ski hill closed for good. However, the area is currently run by the town as a cross-country skiing venue. The T-Bar still partially stands as a reminder to the town of the history. Number 12, Sparwood. Sparwood Ski Hill was most likely built in the 1960s or 1970s, though there is no way to know for sure. Sparwood didn't offer much vertical or challenging terrain, but it did offer an affordable ski hill for the town of Sparwood. In the mid-80s, cross-country ski trails were added through the ski hill. In 1995, Sparwood Ski Hill closed permanently due to rising insurance costs. The base lodge was still standing up until 2013, when the town demolished the old building. There are no known plans to bring back the ski hill, though the area is now a popular cross-country ski train. Number 13, Tabor Mountain. Though currently not operating, Tabor Mountain has made quite the contribution to Prince George's skiing history. Skiing operations here originated after a 1961 forest fire charred much of the mountain, though trails and lifts wouldn't appear until 1967. The ski area started out with two T-bar lifts and a handful of ski runs. In 1975, the ski area expanded with its Skyway triple chairlift, improving flow and establishing itself as one of the few resorts in northern BC with a chairlift. A few years later, a fire in the lift shack caused the chairlift to stop operating for a few months while repairs could be done. Overall, the fire cost the resort around $20,000. Tabor continued to operate much like it always had through the 80s and 90s. In 2018, the resort base lodge suffered a major fire which gutted the building and effectively shut down all skiing operations on Tabor. However, all hope isn't lost here as owners are working to rebuild the lodge and reopen downhill skiing operations. The resort even wants to near triple its footprint which would allow for additional ski runs, downhill mountain biking, and other activities such as cross-country skiing tracks. While the time frame of this is unknown, I do wish the owners of Tabor Mountain the best of luck to reopening. Number 14, Tillicum Valley. Tillicum Valley opened under the name Winter's Head Recreation right outside the city of Vernon. Tucked away in the mountains right outside the city, it marketed itself as a small, family-friendly ski slope. The resort originally featured a Mueller T-Bar lift installed in 1969 servicing two intermediate ski trails. Even though Tillicum wasn't the biggest ski area, it made up for it with night skiing and its close proximity to the city. However, the ski area struggled with attracting large crowds, as the hill was also close to Silver Star Mountain Resort, which had a much bigger footprint than Tillicum, and was also only 45 minutes down the road from Tillicum. In 1978, the ski area upgraded its T-Bar to a Mueller double chairlift and installed an alpine slide to help boost the summer numbers. Unfortunately, Tillicum simply couldn't compete with a much bigger Silver Star and filed for bankruptcy two years later. Everything at Tillicum was auctioned off, and the double chairlift ended up at Lion Mountain, aka Wintergreen, in Bragg Creek, Alberta. Nowadays, nothing really remains of Tillicum Valley, but you can still barely make out the old ski runs. Number 15. Stewart, Grand Duke The Grand Duke Copper Mine was originally surveyed in the 1920s, but due to its remote location, it wasn't seriously considered until 1948, when a small company titled Helicopter Exploration staked several claims in the area. By 1952, the Grand B Mining Company, a large copper producer, sent its own expedition to the mountain. The reports came back glowing, so both Grand B and Helicopter Exploration worked out a deal to form Grand Duke Mines. By September of 1964, the tunnel driving began. The tunnel went from the mine at Leduc Glacier to a mill at Tide Lake. In this way, the Grand Duke mine became one of the biggest copper mines in British Columbia. Though many of the miners lived at the two sites for the mine, many also lived in the town of Stewart. Thus, the mine company invested heavily in the town, giving it many facilities, such as a hospital, schools, a curling rink, and a ski hill. In addition, there were ski hills both at Tide Lake and Leduc Glacier sites. 
Photos from this time show mountains of snow, with a few skiers skiing down the snowy slopes. Honestly, it looks like an amazing experience, but this experience wouldn't last forever. By 1984, the mine shut down completely, largely due to low copper prices. This also shut down all skiing operations in Stewart. Though there was some talk of bringing back the old ski hill in Stewart, nothing really ever came of it, as the town had many other hardships to deal with after the closure of the mine. Number 16. Beaver Valley The Beaver Valley Ski Club was started in the 1960s with a rope tow on the north side of the town of Fruitvale. The tow was around 100 meters long, much of the parts being scrounged from various sources. The hill had a small, rough wooden ski lodge that served small snacks and drinks. A few years later, the hill decided to expand with new land on the south side of town. A new tow was built around 170 meters long. In 1967, as part of Canada's centennial celebrations, the ski club were able to acquire funding for a new T-bar supplied by Doppelmeyer. The T-bar traveled 300 meters up the hill designed by the ski club. In total, the T-bar cost around $13,000. Unfortunately for the Beaver Valley Ski Club, the location was less than ideal as Fruitvale was only a short drive away from the much larger Red Mountain ski area and simply couldn't compete. Thus, the ski club folded in 1972 with most of the equipment sold off to various buyers. Number 17. Grandview Ski Acres Located a short drive outside the city of Kamloops, Grandview commenced skiing operations in 1967, started by two local families. The hill started with a T-bar lift and a rope tow, traveling up the slopes. In 1975, a Mueller double chairlift was installed. Grandview was able to light up one half of the ski area for night skiing, which became a staple of the hill for a number of years. The ski hill had snowmaking, but due to a limited water supply, the snowmaking system only had marginal success. Another reason why Grandview was so successful was the graduated length method, where skiers would start with short skis and progress to longer skis as they improved. This program became a big success at Grandview. Grandview even offered summer grass skiing for a few summers, though this program saw limited success. Around 1995, the ski operation was sold to new owners who intended to operate the hill. However, a limited snowfall forced the closure of Grandview. The double chairlift was sold to Revelstoke when it opened up a new terrain pod above the existing ski area. Grandview still operates, though as a summer wedding and retreat venue. Number 18. Aklo Ski Hill Nowadays, the closest ski hill to Cranbrook is Kimberley Alpine Resort, around an hour and a half's drive away from the city. But just a few decades ago, Cranbrook had its own community ski hill. The Aklo Ski Hill was formed in 1972, when a group of skiers formed the Cranbrook Ski Developments Limited and chose the site for the ski hill. Though the hill was much smaller than neighboring Kimberley, it was only half a mile from downtown Cranbrook and could easily be reached by everyone. The name Aklo which was chosen by Sophie Pierre, means snow in Tunaha. The goal was to provide residents of Cranbrook with easy, affordable skiing. The ski hill was originally planning to just use two rope toes, but instead decided on a Harouche T-bar lift. The ski hill had a lodge with a cafeteria, as well as a ski rental facility. Aklo also featured night skiing. Unfortunately, the south-facing exposure of Aklo made it very difficult to hold good snow. The 1973 season started out rough, and the ski hill was only able to open in February due to bad snow conditions. Aklo operated until around 1978, when poor snow levels forced the closure of the hill completely. Nowadays, it is an acreage development, and all traces of the ski hill are completely gone. Number 19. 100 Mile House The 100 Mile House Ski Hill project was spearheaded by local resident, Dick Larson, who had been a lifelong skier. The first ski hill he constructed was near Forest Grove and featured an old rope tow constructed from a 1957 Plymouth car. By the second year, thanks to some persuasion by skiers in the community, Dick moved his rope tow to a hill closer to a 100 mile house. Since this new hill had double the vertical of Dick's original ski hill, he constructed a second rope tow with a 1953 Pontiac. By 1972, the Ainsworth Lumber Company had taken notice of the ski area and installed a Harouche T-bar lift. The old rope toes were sold to a smaller ski hill in Clinton. The ski hill operated on and off in the 80s, often suffering from poor snow conditions. 
The ski hill finally closed in 1987 when the Mount Timothy ski hill was constructed, eventually replacing both the 100 mile house and Timberland ski hills. Number 20, Timberland. Much similar to the ski hill at 100 mile house, the Timberland Ski Club was formed in 1967 and served as the community ski hill for Williams Lake. The ski hill was built using grant money from the government, including the T-Bar lift, which was supplied by GMD Mueller. The Timberland Ski Club wasn't the biggest ski hill ever, but they did have a good variety of runs, ranging from easy to expert. Throughout the early 80s, the ski hill really struggled due to record low snow levels. The hill never opened for the 82 to 83 or the 83 to 84 seasons, but operated for a few seasons after that. But by 1987, a new ski hill was being developed at higher elevations that would hold snow better, rendering both the Timberland and 100 mile ski hills obsolete. The Mueller T-Bar from Timberland was sent to Mount Timothy, where it continues to operate to this day. Number 21, Kamloops Ski Hill. Kamloops has a rich skiing past. While today, skiers ride the expansive slopes of Sun Peaks or the smaller slopes of Harper Mountain, skiing here dates back to at least the 1920s when the first ski tow was constructed for the Kamloops Ski Club. In the early years, ski jumping definitely seemed to be the focus here, but by the 1950s, the hill was slowly transitioning to a more downhill skiing focus. Throughout its life, the hill only ever had a rope tow. There was also a small ski lodge that would serve snacks and drinks as well. Unfortunately, in the early 1970s, the lodge burnt to the ground, which effectively closed the ski area down. Low elevation and low vertical drop might have also been another factor in not rebuilding and looking at other hills instead. Today, there is a Costco at the base of the former hill and condos at the top of the hill. Number 22, Burke Mountain. Burke Mountain is a very interesting study, much similar to the Hollyburn Resort in Vancouver. Burke Mountain was home to over 100 cabins tucked away on the mountainside where families would go for a weekend or two. The people in the community had long been skiing down the Burke Ski Slope, but in the mid-60s, a company formed titled Burke Mountain Resorts Limited. This company built a ski lodge and two rope tows, making accessibility much easier for the residents of Burke Mountain. But by 1969, only two years after the opening of the resort, Burke Mountain shut down skiing operations. The families who owned cabins in Burke Mountain continued to ski the trails for some time. But eventually, skiing here faded into complete obscurity. Number 23, 100 Steps. 100 Steps Ski Hill was the dream of a local Prince George father who wanted to build a ski area inside the city limits. Through much hard work, he was able to build a rope tow and a T-bar in 1968. 100 Steps became a hub for the city and offered reciprocal tickets to Purden. All the trails at 100 Steps were lit up for night skiing and the area featured a ski lodge servicing food and drinks. Unfortunately, the ski hill kept losing money year after year and by 1974, the original owner threw in the towel. The city picked up ownership of the hill and planned to run it as a city recreation area. Unfortunately, in December of 1974, a fire gutted the ski lodge. The city decided to halt skiing operations on 100 steps as the hill was not doing well financially and turned it into a municipal park. Today, practically nothing remains of the old ski hill, yet it is a nice piece of Prince George's skiing history. Number 24, Micah Creek. Micah Creek was a small community ski hill built in the town of Micah Creek. The town was used as the operations base for the Micah Dam hydroelectric project in the 60s and 70s. This project ensured that there was a boom in the town, with the population peaking at 4,000 people in 1973. During this period, the town had many amenities, including a small community ski hill. The hill only had two runs and a T-bar installed by Jim D. Mueller. Gradually, as the dam was finished, the town shrunk in size. I'm not exactly sure when the ski hill closed, but by the mid-80s, it was all gone. However, there is now a heli skiing operation that has its base in Micah Creek, so in some ways, the ski hill lives on. Number 25, Cassiar. The Cassiar Asbestos Company was formed in 1951 after discovering asbestos in the area. In 1952, the company established the town of Cassiar and started mining operations. 
Due to the town's remote location, trips to bigger towns and cities were expensive and rare. So to attract more families to the town, the Cassier Asbestos Company invested in many facilities, such as a community center, hockey rink, and a ski hill. The ski hill was around 400 vertical feet high and had a Doppelmayr T-bar lift, as well as a few rope toes. For the years the mine was in service, the Cassier Ski Hill provided the town with a form of entertainment and a chance for the residents of the town to improve upon their skiing. But by 1992, demand had diminished so much for asbestos that the mining company decided to close the mine and liquidate the town. Thus, almost all the town was auctioned off piece by piece and trucked away. This was obviously the end of the ski hill. Nowadays, there isn't much remaining of the town of Cassiar, and the area is private property. But it is a very unique story, one that often gets overlooked and needs to be told. Number 26, Blue River. Located in the community of Blue River, the Blue River Ski Club was a well-established club that had its roots all the way back to the 30s. While it's somewhat unclear when they built their ski hill, I do know that the hill was established in the early 60s with a rope tow lift and a few ski trails. In the 1970s, Blue River installed night lighting for their small ski hill. But by the mid-1980s, the small community hill was gone, presumably not being able to compete with the much larger Clearwater ski hill. Number 27, Mount Ida. Did you know that Salmon Arm once had its own ski area? Built on the slopes of Mount Ida, it opened in the late 1970s with a handful of ski trails, but was expanded in 1984 with runs going up the mountain. The ski hill had been relying on a rope tow and a 40 passenger snowcat used to shuttle passengers to the top of the ski hill. The managers at Mount Ida had plans to install a T-bar lift and eventually a chairlift, but unfortunately, due to a series of poor winters, these plans never came to fruition. Instead, the small ski hill closed permanently, the run still barely visible from the town. Number 28, Clinton Ski Hill. The Clinton Ski Hill was a small, family-oriented ski hill. The hill originally opened with a used rope hill from the 100 Mile House Ski Hill in 1978. The ski hill was constructed by the Clinton Snow Jockey Club, who supported cross-country and downhill skiing operations. The hill didn't have a huge vertical drop, but did offer around three to four wooded runs, with a small cafeteria at the bottom. Unfortunately, due to a waning public interest in downhill skiing, along with vandalism and rising costs, the ski hill closed in 1985. All of the runs are still visible, assigned to the town of days gone by. Number 29, Mount Diadem. Located near the Powell River, the Mount Diadem Ski Club was a short-lived hike-to ski area that operated during the 70s. The ski area was constructed around 1972 and featured two rope tow lifts along with a handful of ski runs, a ski patrol hut, and a small ski lodge. The hill only operated on Sundays for all its life. Unfortunately, in 1977, the club suffered the loss of its ski lodge due to a fire that started in the kitchen. Thus, the Mount Diadem Ski Club closed its rope toes long gone. Number 30, Northlander. Today, tourists from all around the world come to visit Canada's majestic Glacier National Park. The rugged mountains and dense forests are just some of the reasons that make the Rogers Pass area so scenic. Today, thanks to the abundant snowfall, Rogers Pass is a huge backcountry skiing area. But what many people probably don't know is that for around a decade, Rogers Pass actually had its own ski hill. The hill was built in 1964 by the adjacent hotel, which back then was called the Northlander Hotel. The hill featured two rope tow lifts and night skiing operated by the hotel. They also ran snowcats up to the top of one of the mountains, giving skiers an easier time accessing that abandoned powder. While the ski area may have had plans to expand the hill, thanks to the hill being in a national park, the ski area only operated for around 12 to 15 years. I'm not really sure when it closed, but based on what I have found, the skiing operations here probably ceased around the early 1980s. Today, almost no one has heard of the old ski hill, and probably no one will ever know. After many struggles with Parks Canada, the hotel closed in 2012 and was finally demolished in 2019. I hope you enjoyed this video. This one took countless hours to make, and several times I was tempted just to give up. But nonetheless, it's finally here, and I'm very happy about that. 
If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to my channel. And until next time, this is Skier72.